Jesse, can you see me moving or am I frozen? I look frozen on my You're frozen. That's weird. But can you, you can hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm laughing at Michael's. Is he going to come on or do we just get to see his house? <laughs> Hello, you're back. I'm still frozen. Now I'm gone. Wow. There we go. Oh. Well, it's six o'clock. And how are we doing there? We are missing a few people still, um, but it looks like we have a, oh, actually, now that I can see everybody, looks like we have, we definitely have a quorum. We are missing Melissa and Chad, but, um, but we have a quorum, so you're welcome to begin anytime. Okay. So I'm going to call the meeting to order. It is 6.01. Welcome. And I'm going to call the roll. So if you can say here, when I call your name, uh, Yvonne, Commissioner Yvonne Clinton. Here. Commissioner Jill Kaur. Here. Who's that? Mm -hmm. That's it. It's absent. Uh, Commissioner Michael French. Probably muted. <laughs> we. <laughs> Michael, you're muted. Can you unmute and say here, please? I see him. Michael, can you hear us? Doesn't look like it. Doesn't look like he can hear. Hmm. Okay. That's uh, weird. Yeah. Michael, can you hear us? We, uh, we have the chat feature disabled on here, so we also like can't actually post a message. That's very strange. I wonder where he is. Okay, why don't you keep going and- Okay, yeah, that was, why I, that was why I was wondering about the chat. Okay, cool. Uh, Commissioner Melissa Moreno is absent. Uh, Commissioner Patricia Quinn. Here. Here. Uh, Commissioner Carol Smith. Here. Okay. Good, and Michael, Michael, can you hear us? Michael French. I'm uh, trying to, I'm sending him an email right now. I don't know why. Yes, he, I can hear you. Oh, yeah. whoo. Yeah. And, All and right. Commissioner Fisk is here. I was just tardy. Okay. Oh, Alex, great. Fisk Thank is you. Here as well. Excellent. All righty. Excellent. So, uh, we have to administer the oath of office. So our new commissioners. And the way we're gonna do this is you are going to mute yourself. The oath will appear on the screen and you will recite it. And raise your hand when you're done. And then you will be official. So mute yourself so we don't have a cacophony, please. And uh, the oath should appear on the screen there, right? 
Um, Jesse, if you don't, I have it ready to pop up if you don't, if it's not in the, um, in the PowerPoint, which I don't imagine it is. Great. No, it's not in. So uh, <laughs> and then I'll hand it over to you. All right. So can everybody see this very official document? Excellent. So please mute and at your uh, immediate convenience, read that out loud, please. And raise your hand when you're done. I actually can't see the people on the screen now because this is covering my screen of you guys. So will somebody just give me a heads up when everybody's finished? Okay, I see Jillian is finished. I see Vaughn is finished. I see that, uh, who are the, uh, Michael, oh, we're still waiting for Michael. And he's finished. So that's it, right? Those are our new members. You are official. Yeah. Thank you. Ta -da. Thank you. And just as a follow up, <laughs> hi. Um, I received most of your signed oaths. And if you have not sent me the signed copy of it, please do so at your earliest convenience. Thank you. Okay, I would like now to have a motion to approve the agenda. If somebody could please uh, do that for me, raise your hand. Thank you, Vaughn. Could you do that? Okay. I make a motion to approve the agenda. Thank you. Could I have somebody second it? Raise your hand, please, to ask to second it. I'm looking for a hand in the air there. Somebody volunteer to second the motion. Uh, there goes uh, Commissioner Fisk, please. I second the motion. OK. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Excellent. The motion passes. Okay. Do we have any announcements from staff commissioners and liaisons? Anyone have a comment they'd like to make? Raise your hand, please, for that. I don't see any announcements. Uh, do we have actually? There's. Actually, I see Pat's hand is up. Pat's hand is up. Okay. I yeah. Okay. Uh, Pat, go ahead, please. I have a, I have a question, not any information. Um, I think somebody stepped this stepped me through this last time. How can I see all of the participants? What do I need to do to see all of the participants? So, in your upper right hand corner, there should be a little box that says View. And if you click on it, it'll give you a few choices and you want to select side-by-side -side gallery. Yeah, so I don't have that little box. Um, it's possible that it says it someplace else on yours because you were using an iPad, is that? I'm using an iPad, right. And okay. I took me a minute to find it, but I didn't find yeah, it. Yeah, I don't know where it is on an iPad. I don't know if anybody else has an iPad and is familiar with the layout on iPad. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any public comment? Actually, I do. Before you get to public comment, um, but I, I have an announcement for this okay. one. Great. Please. Um, so I should have sent everybody, or I did send, and everybody should have received an announcement that there are several other commissions, thankfully not ours, that are in the process of doing recruitments. Um, please check that notice. And if you have friends or colleagues who you think would be interested in serving on another city commission, please share that information so that we can load those commissions up with awesome community members. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. And I keep freezing, but I'm here, I promise you. <laughs> so uh, do we have any public comment that has been sent in? We haven't received any that I'm aware of. We do have two attendees 
um, but there was no pre-submitted comment. Excellent. So let us, uh, we need to have a motion to approve the minutes. Do we have someone who so moves? I move. Uh, who is? Um, Yvonne. Yvonne, go ahead, please. Okay, I move to accept the minutes. Okay, thank you. Do we have a second to that? Commissioner Quinn, I second the motion to approve the minutes. Thank you, we're approved. And we are now moving on to a presentation, which uh, Rachel is going to introduce them, please. Thank you. So I am very pleased to introduce tonight Brett Snyder and Claire Napolon. And I want to make sure, yeah, you're both on there. And um, some of the, yeah, hold your hands up. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us tonight in this evening when I'm sure you'd rather be kicking back doing something else, but we are very happy to have you here. Um, Claire and Brett were joined us last year, actually it was in the last year that was actually the several years ago that feels like last year, but prior to COVID, um, the city went into contract with their firm, Cheng Snyder, to work on the community outreach portion of the wastewater treatment plant um, public arts initiative. So just as, as backdrop, we received when the city redid their whole wastewater treatment plant um, a number of years ago, there was a huge 1% contribution that came into our municipal arts fund. So $690,000, which is a total windfall. We have never before and probably will never again see that kind of municipal arts funding coming into our program. So it's a really unique and fabulous opportunity for us. Um, to, to really have a huge amount of money to spend in the next few years on some really amazing projects, hopefully. So the launching point of that is to work with Brett and Claire to do community outreach, to have, um, to really gain the, um, the feedback from the community and sort of create a sense of ownership from the community of this project and also doing a lot of work directly with our wastewater staff who, while they're not panelists on this call right now, are, um, are hopefully watching it. Actually, but Jesse, you said you can't see anybody else on here. Anyway, no matter. I'm sorry. Um, that's okay. <laughs> um, no, I, I don't, I don't know. Can you just see people that are watching the meeting or not? Uh, I can see that there are three attendees. Okay, uh, great. So if you are an attendee from wastewater treatment staff, Thank you. Hello. Good evening. We're very happy to have you here as part of this. Um, stay tuned for more. So, so Claire and Brett are going to give an overview of their work, what attracted us to them. They have a very unique um, role, and we just happen to be lucky enough to have people that have this very particular niche of expertise in our own community, which you'll hear is pretty niche, pretty awesome. Um, so I'm just going to let you take it away, please. Thank you. <laughs> before I just babble on and on. We're really, really excited to start the project. Um, hopefully again soon, it was put on hold, it was just getting ready to happen when COVID started. So we paused it and now we are hopefully launching it again very soon. Take it away. And you should be able to share your screens. Okay. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the really nice introduction, Rachel. Um, it's so appreciated. And we're really just excited to work with all of you. Um, so I am gonna share my screen. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so everyone should be able to see, maybe anyone that wants to give a thumbs up, you can see, and then actually Claire is gonna start the presentation. Can folks see, see the screen? Yes. Great, excellent. Yeah, Rachel, thanks so much for the introduction and for asking us to be here. We're really excited. I apologize, the lighting in my space is a little bit wonky, um, but hopefully you can you can kind of see me. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Claire Napuan, um, and together with Brett Snyder, we're really excited to be working with Rachel and the city um, on this great opportunity. Um, so we are, um, we are by training 
uh, architect, landscape architect, urban design and planning. And um, we're envi environmental designers with expertise in participatory design methods. Um, and we often employ those methods to achieve goals, um, big goals such as um, connecting communities to a better understanding of their built environment, um, helping to create communications between community members and municipalities so that priorities can be shared um, and sort of um, coalesced. Uh, and then finally, empowering community members so that they can have the capacity to improve the resilience of their own built environment. And that's kind of how we like to work. Um, I'll give some more specifics as we kind of go through this presentation. So Brett, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Um, we'd like to really acknowledge the kind of work that preceded our own. So, you know, we're not the first to kind of practice in this way with a kind of focus on um, social context um, within our design practice. These are just a few environmental artists who kind of precede our work um, doing the kind of thing that we think is really important um, in terms of un connecting communities with their sense of place. Um, these are environmental artists that are really looking to reveal the connections that uh, currently exist between you know, domestic practice or personal household actions and habits and how they can have sort of long-term effects on their built environments, such as infrastructure. So, you know, just to give two examples, Joe Hansen on the top left there, um, thinking about city streets as being a kind of important place, public space um, that can use kind of community action in terms of collectively sweeping um, and making that a kind of civic celebratory um, uh, exhibition, so to speak. Um, or the work of Gorda, Gordon Matta-Clark, who's actually taking a, a home, a domicile, and sort of slicing it in half to sort of expose all the different um, pieces of infrastructure that make that home work, um, the electricity, the piping, the plumbing, um, all of that thing, all the things that really get hidden um, in a, a, you know, in a kind of normal home, but are very important to the function of it and connect that home to all the other homes and the infrastructure and the city itself. And so, you know, we, we definitely want to make sure to pay homage to um, kind of their influence. So if you'll go to the next slide. So um, talk about two earlier projects that kind of used, helped us build the kind of sets of tools that we use to accomplish our work. Um, like I said, we're really interested in thinking about community resilience and how people understand their built environments, I think is really critical to that. So this is a project called Our Changing Climate that takes kind of a big idea, big like global scale, infrastructural, political, environmental problem, you know, climate crisis, global environmental change, um, but tries to rescale it to, you know, real livable experiences that individuals are already having. So we're not talking about polar ice caps or acidification of oceans, but we're talking about, um, you know, the cost of food um, or uh, access to public transportation, you know, the things that real people are actually experiencing and then connecting that back to climate change. Um, and the fun part about this work is we, we work with a lot of youth, um, youth in cities and around the San Francisco Bay area. Um, and so using, um, techniques like social media, scavenger hunts, um, and then you can see in the top right corner, we actually like put um, young people on the map, the kind of vulnerability map to make, you know, try to make real the things that often are kind of broader scaled um, and very, um, um, very sort of data driven and not experiential. So the next slide. So more recently, we've applied similar techniques, actually even more techniques, um, in the Alameda Creek watershed. That's kind of the southern part of the San Francisco Bay, um, cities of Fremont, uh, Newark, uh, and Union City. 
Um, there we were looking specifically again at climate change, um, but engaging people in understanding their relationship to a watershed and the Alameda Creek um, as a place that is um, an important part of the infrastructure of their landscape. Um, so using things like models, um, using again social media, there's a hashtag like public sediment, public sediment being the kind of um, name of our team and, and referring to the like the one resource that is really critical to building resilience, which is sediment or mud or dirt. Um, and working with municipalities, other stakeholders, um, youth groups, senior centers, um, you know, a broad range of diverse community members within that watershed, we developed this kind of collective communication piece called the Alameda Creek Atlas, translated as you can see in Mandarin as well as Spanish, and really trying to reflect all the different priorities about this place um, in an effort to build community resilience. Uh, I'm excited to say too that in 2019, this project won the um, Environmental Design Research Association's top prize for great places, place research. Um, so that was kind of a, a, a nice win for us. So next slide, Brett. So the project, though, that really, I think, um, initiated the connection that we built with Rachel um, uh, in, in thinking about Davis is a project that we did in San Jose as um, consultants to the city's DOT um, Environmental Service Department and their public art program. Um, and it's a, public, it's a project called Fog Waste. Um, it was something that we thought was gonna be kind of once in a lifetime because it, it was so specifically geared towards the things that Brett and I like to do and, and really predated some of that earlier work I just showed. It, it was a call for artists who were interested in exploring the relationships between um, sustainability, community practices, like domestic practices, and sewer infrastructure. And I still remember reading the call with Brett and like, oh my gosh, this is once in a lifetime. Like how many, how many calls are we gonna receive this? And of course, now we feel like we're, we're having a second moment in our lifetime where we're getting a chance to talk about art and sewers. Um, but I mean, what it really comes down to is, is that this is the kind of work that Brett and I are really excited about. We love talking about sewers. We love trying to bring an understanding of their significance to, you know, urban resilience and sustainability. So as part of that initiative, we really kind of dove deep into getting to know all the facets of the wastewater treatment system overall in San Jose. So that meant touring the actual treatment facility, uh, that meant riding along with first responders, um, who come to sort of maintain and also respond to any kinds of overflows or problems that are happening with the sewers. And then also meeting um, with different existing community groups, um, mostly parenting groups with pub within public elementary schools that are were located in pilot neighborhoods that were identified as being sort of hot spots for um, residential backups um, in sewers. And that's backup mostly of what's called fog waste, so fats, oils, and grease. And interestingly enough, in San Jose, that's the number one cause of sewer backups is the residential. So it's not like big, it's not like restaurants or large industry. It's these like little collective practices of all these homes and how they're managing waste. So it's kind of an interesting and um, an interesting problem because it's it's dispersed, small scale, but like collectively has a huge impact. So rather than spending you know, millions of dollars on sewer upgrades. Um, the city invested a small amount in us. Brett, if you wanna to go to the next slide, in really thinking through how to um, accomplish uh, some community um, capacity building uh, to address this issue um, and through public art. And so we went to community meetings to sort of learn their priorities, but it's really difficult to come to a community meeting and say, let's talk about fat oil and grease waste. So instead we came with it to communities talking about recipes and sharing ideas about food as a kind of cultural practice, but also from there talking about the waste generated from those meals and creating waste recipe cards. Do you wanna to go to the next slide, Brett? 
And that all sort of played out. And um, back in, I think the finally in 2016, we launched the pilot installation, which included a sort of suite of scales um, right down to like the household drain to the manhole cover, to the service trucks that, you know, were going or moving through the neighborhoods and servicing these lines to sort of show the artifacts of what's usually an invisible sewer system. Um, we chose this sort of highlight color green that DOT was like really, they, they were approved of. They were actually really instrumental in the installation of this project. They did the clean, the, um, the spray paints of the manholes. They helped cut, fold and distribute the graphics that really explained the connection. Again, trilingual graphics this time in Vietnamese, Spanish and English. Um, and it was really well received by the community members that helped us sort of co-design this. Um, and they've already seen um, positive benefits to their sewers as a result of this project. And as a result, the, the city was awarded um, the Teng Wu Pollution Prevention Award in 2016 um, for, for this project. So moving on to the next slide. We know Davis and San Jose are very different. So I'm gonna pass off to Brett to talk a little bit about how we're approaching it um, locally. Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, diving into Davis, um, I think one of the things that just um, we see as a just kind of initial challenge, um, one is that of course the, the city of Davis wastewater treatment plant um, is in a different place than um, most of the inhabitants of Davis. And just, you can kind of see in the diagram here, um, you have the, the city of Davis kind of outlined in magenta on the left, um, and then more or less halfway between Davis and Sacramento, um, you have the wastewater treatment plant. So I think just thinking about this relationship of where the people are and, and where the wastewater treatment plant um, is something that, um, you know, that we can think about and strategize um, collectively on. Um, so we we kind of kicked this off with what we called a, a phase zero, um, <laughs> which was back in 2019, uh, and actually was with a, a studio that I taught at UC Davis, uh, where the students visited the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and of course, we're, we're visiting here, we had actually, surprisingly enough, maybe a couple of years earlier, I had visited with students around a different project. Um, so we had actually visited kind of prior to um, the upgrades at the wastewater treatment plant, um, but this was our first time visiting kind of post upgrades. And, you know, as you can see in this picture, it, it's really beautiful. I mean, it, it's kind of a beautiful piece of infrastructure. Um, and I think the students just learned so much um, going to see it. And uh, yeah, it was exciting to get to see the process. The, the process really changed the way that they process wastewater. So it used to um, take a long time. I can't remember offhand exactly how long, it, but it was it was quite long. And now it, I believe it, it's down to maybe like 24 hours where wastewater is processed. So it's really like um, it just really contracted the amount of time um, that it takes to process the wastewater. Um, Looking at this next slide, of course, we have the um, just the sanitary sewer system uh, in downtown Davis, and, and you can see obviously a very um, kind of elaborate network of, uh, of sewer laterals uh, throughout the city. Um, but we also see, you know, we, we kind of imagine that there really could potentially be multiple sites that are considered as part of this. So um, after the wastewater um, is treated, um, it, it goes, um, of course, uh, here to the, um, God, I'm forgetting the name of this, the, the um, right next to the wastewater treatment facility. Sorry, can you? Is that the, that? the Davis wetlands? Thank you, thank you. Patricia the wetlands. wetlands. Exactly, yeah. thank you. Um, um, in a really beautiful site in, um, that um, actually used to be more integrated um, with the wastewater treatment, um, but actually in the new processes is kind of less integral to the, the treatment of the, the wastewater. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, just teaching that studio at Davis to, to begin thinking about how we could approach this in, in working with the city to, to strategize how we um, reach out to, um, to artists 
we just started to think about some of the different themes um, that could be connected to how artists and designers are um, connected to uh, the wastewater treatment. Um, and so we just, you know, we kind of put these into, you know, different kind of themes that we thought about. Um, of course, just artwork that might bring attention to the wastewater treatment. And, and you can imagine things like um, text uh, in relationship to that. Um, again, kind of thinking back to some of the images we showed before, um, that obviously it's a very sophisticated network of, um, you know, of sort of laterals throughout the city. Um, also, this, this next image of awareness, we could imagine something that um, just brings an awareness to all of this, what, what really is invisible infrastructure. We don't really see um, any of that infrastructure around us until, um, you know, thinking of the example of San Jose, um, the, um, the Department of Transportation workers would, would um, you know, put out their orange cones and would kind of be in people's way. And, and that's when you kind of um, bring awareness. But are there other ways that, that might bring a kind of greater awareness? Um, also, just the idea of connection. Um, you know, the, the, our sore laterals are something that actually, as Tara was talking about, actually connect everyone's house. They also connect people to um, the Davis wetland. So really just thinking about this um, as, a, as a kind of cycle. Um, we could also imagine this um, in terms of, you know, this is our, the, the kind of community infrastructure. And are there ways that we could, you know, think of public art as, as kind of embracing uh, that. Um, also potentially thinking about experience. Um, are there different ways? I mean, both thinking of downtown Davis, uh, some of the public places, public parks, uh, other places where we could either bring in these last couple ideas, either of experience um, or education, and, and looking at some of these great projects that have really integrated um, water into, um, you know, the, the art installation itself. And, and of course, you know, we're all familiar with uh, the drought in California and how um, just water usage has been such an important issue over the, the past many years and, and how that might connect us to uh, the wastewater treatment facility. Uh, so again, in this kind of stage um, zero where I was working with my students at, at UC Davis, I just wanted to highlight a few projects that, that came out of that work. Um, and so um, this, this first one on the upper left that was one of my favorite ones um, called Ooze was a, a, a couple of students that worked with each other around creating an augmented reality game uh, that would allow people to um, kind of tour the this hidden sewer system beneath the sidewalks. And again, a project I really loved and, and um, you know, again, kind of brought this sewer system to life. Uh, the project in the upper right here um, that thinks about what goes into um, the sewer system just in the streets. So um, one way, obviously, we can cut, um, you know think about it from a sustainability perspective. And when things, um, you know, things like oil and petrochemicals go into the sewers in the streets, um, that you know is a significant problem. Um, another project that I really liked this project Drip that just started to um, you know paint water usage on on people's houses. Um, that that. Um, again was a kind of just way of um, really thinking about water usage uh, and then the last one on the right uh, was thinking about our public parks as a place where um, one could imagine um, public art that would potentially educate around um, either water usage or uh, our connection to wastewater uh, and then a last project that i'll just highlight it came out of this studio um, was actually if we think about all that water moving beneath us um, that actually just using that to create a kind of soundscape. Um, and so these images are just of this idea of this project um, that uh, used the, the kind of movement of water. Um, and actually one of the things that just really, when we met with the um, wastewater treatment facility, they felt that they, they knew just the, um, just seeing how much water was coming in, how different it was, um, you know, when students during the, the year um, as opposed to the, the summer months and just how different that was in terms of how much water was actually coming through uh, their facility. Um, and then just going on to this, um, this project that um, actually is a project that, that we did 
um, during the pandemic, I, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, when Claire and I started working with Rachel, we were thinking, obviously, it was pre pandemic, and we were thinking that we would be engaging with people, um, you know, going to the farmers market, and we actually had a kind of first meeting where we strategized what are the different places where we're going to go and, and meet with people. And of course, we imagine that that may still be able to happen. We still haven't, you know, fully kind of finalized a, a, a timeline um, of this uh, project, but but there are ways even that we can do now. I mean, just like we're kind of uh, uh, sharing some of this information with all of you, we've done projects like this one, and I'll just go to the next slide um, that has a little movie that this poster where we integrated um, kind of augmented reality components um, to um, to a poster that that was actually created working with people completely remotely. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight this project that has actually happened um, during the pandemic. Um, let's see, going on to our, it's not letting me go to the next slide. Um, there we go. So actually, um, that is the last presentation slide. And actually, the, the really the next part, um, and I think Rachel maybe told us we had five or 10 more minutes really um, to just kind of center discussion. And we have, um, we just have a series of questions actually on two slides that, that could really be discussion points. Um, and um, maybe just to highlight here, um, you know, a few questions. So, uh, and I, again, I'm not entirely sure if we have someone from the wastewater treatment plan. I, I will say that um, we have posed this question to folks at the treatment plant before. Um, is there a fundamental issue, challenge, or message that they would like us to include? But I would also, you know, kind of address that to all the folks from the city here. Um, is there a fundamental issue that, that some of you have been thinking about in relationship to, um, you know, wastewater, water in general, um, that, that, that you feel is, is really kind of pressing to the to folks in Davis that, that we could um, kind of integrate in the outreach around this project. Um, the next one, are there concerns regarding the city of Davis wastewater system um, that need awareness? Again, kind of related to the first question. Um, and then uh, the last one, is there ways that we could kind of integrate any long-term planning um, into the, the outreach for this project? So maybe we could pause on this slide and if there's any um, one more slide with questions, but if, if anyone has any thoughts related to um, any of these questions that, that might want to respond. And I can't necessarily see people, so. Um, I uh, you've got, maybe I'll call on some folks. I think I saw Patricia's hand go up first. Maybe I'll stop the share so it just allows people to. Oh, yeah. to oh you're about. muted. I'm sorry. Yeah. There you go. Okay. How about now? Yes, Good. I can hear you. Okay. So um, this is something that I've discussed with my friends, and I, I suppose I could do see some research and figure it out. But maybe you guys know this. Uh, uh, recently, I think it was in the paper, the fact that we are now going to well water again for water supply in Davis because of the, dr of the drought. Mm. Did we know that was gonna happen? That's not something that I can answer. But so, <laughs> so let me plug in here and say that, well, a couple things. I'm, I'm sorry that we don't have our actual water treatment staff on the call with us. So they, unfortunately, they're watching our Civic Arts Commission meeting, but they're not able to interact. I actually did send John um, and Ruth, who are at least the two staff that I know who are watching a message, just letting them know um, that they can email me feedback if they want it, if they want me to pose that here. But obviously this is one portion of multiple conversations taking place. Um, and as Brett mentioned, the questions that he put up here were posed directly to the staff. So that feedback was shared by our actual wastewater treatment staff and will continue to have opportunities for that. So one thing that I learned in this process that's really important and that is not obvious to many people is that we have multiple water systems in the community. We have our wastewater treatment system. We have our water system, which is a separate system where we get clean water. Um, and then the waste is a separate system and, and 
Claire and Brett probably do know much more in general about that than I do. But no, but we're not we're not here to answer kind of questions about the system in general. And we definitely could bring other people back from other departments in the future, and and probably should. Um, I will put just put a plug in here and let you know that a, a later item in our agenda is talking about updates into our municipal arts fund. And one of those is that we finally also received a quite large chunk of money from the surface water project, which was a number of years ago. So concurrent with this wastewater treatment project, we also will have the ability to spend a, a generous amount of funds on just water related things that aren't necessarily wastewater related things, <laughs> just to confuse the matters even more. Um, I hope that is that helpful, Pat, at all. Yeah, and I, I realized that I was going out on a limb that they might, I, I know that their emphasis is wastewater, but you know, I just yeah. thought they had heard something about that whole phenomenon because I, I, I didn't know, but I understand. I can, I can find out questions like that. I do believe that that is the system we have in place that when it gets low enough in the water table that then we, we revert back to um, you mm -hmm. know, the available water source. I'm at close right. So Rachel, if I can uh, jump in really quickly. So that, that is true. And um, you know, there is, a, we were never on a completely on river water is my, is my understanding is that we've always pulled a little bit and depending on the time of year you the mix is is changes a bit and because of the drought uh you know we are we will you know get more water from wells the city council got a, a very good presentation on this uh, a couple of months ago i think now and that is um that's still available if we can find that link and send that forward because it, it's quite detailed uh so if people are curious about that uh we can we can pull that up and then send it out thanks gloria i think the next question was from carol is that right uh yeah how do i lower my hand there we go <laughs> uh thank you um uh patricia that's a good point you know i i've been in davis long enough we were 100 percent well water and then i think we went down as low as 11 percent, and then you didn't have that scummy stuff in your tea anymore and we were getting the rest of it from the sacramento river and then i just saw we're back up to 100 <laughs> percent, and i'm like whoa i have to turn on my water softener again bummer uh, but anyways, um, some of the one issue I thought of, about in regards to the sewer system in Davis. Just a minute, I'm getting a a phone coming in here. Sorry, um, was uh, annoying me. Anyways, uh, one thing in in our um, sewer system here in Davis, we're testing for COVID, right? which is so interesting to me that, and you know, you're talking about these laterals and these laterals are following the streets and apparently all of our street, you know, the sewer system is, is under our streets, right? And so that whole thing is kind of fascinating to me um, so that you would have these hot spots, you know, of where COVID's going up and other cooler spots where COVID is going down in the city and, um, you know, I think of art as hot and cold colors, et cetera. So, I mean, I can see a lot of connection there. Uh, when it comes to just that Waitwater plant, and I have taken a tour of it as well, and I was really impressed with all the machinery. Um, you know, I know <laughs> there's a big issue, I think, just in general with uh, what you put down your drain, right? Or what you flush down your toilet, right? And um, so in terms of putting things through your garbage disposal, maybe to think about that, where it's going, or, you know, there's been a issue with wipes, I know, <laughs> at the, the sewer plant, I'm sure you heard them grouse about that. Um, so that came to mind. And, um, oh, what was uh, something else? Uh, just the whole idea, I, I'm, I'm thinking just in general, you know, you have the water, the good water coming in and then the wastewater going out and 
it does fit into the bigger picture with the watersheds that are in Davis and uh, which is kind of everything. And I'm in far West Davis. So we have a stone gate lake. It's part of our watershed. We also have the West Davis pond. Um, and depending on the time of year, it goes dry or not. And then where we end up having to pump more well water. Um, so anyways, those are sort of the things that came to my mind. Thank you. That's all really interesting and helpful. Yeah, we had heard about this that epidemiologists often utilize, you know, data from from wastewater treatment plants, and that's that's been true in other places too. So yeah, that's definitely something we're thinking about. And you can't talk to anybody who maintains sewers without hearing a story about wet wipes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <You> just. <laughs> And it's just so interesting that the COVID mole molecule, the, the virus itself has such an interesting structure, you know, that round with all the little yeah. points on it, like a kind of a sunburst. It's, it's really, or, or someone took an orange and put in a bunch of, um, you know, a spice. Yeah, um, yeah, all spice. Or yeah. clove, clove. Right. That's cloves, it. that's what I'm thinking of. Right, anyways, thank you. Oh, and I just want to acknowledge that we see John now. Yay. Hi, John. Hi, John. So I think Chad had his hand next. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I think to me, like the, the thing that comes to mind with with wastewater is like the, um, I don't know, the, the perception that like, I guess maybe it's a branding thing, right? Like by calling it wastewater, it is wastewater when it goes to the treatment plant. But I think there's a perception that, that I kind of have in the back of my head that I think maybe other people have is that it's somehow inferior water once it's treated. Like it's good for like, you know, watering the lawn at the golf course or something. But I think, you know, messaging about, you know, about mm -hmm. wastewater that's been fully treated and ready to, you know, ready to go back into the, the full usable water cycle, to me, that mm -hmm. would be a helpful um, thing to, that I think to, to message out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there is a stigma about recycled water. Right. Yeah. But with a drought, we, we've got to get over that. <laughs> awesome. So I, I can't remember if it was Michael or Ruth who had their hand up next. Um, Michael was next. OK, thanks, Ruth. Uh, I noticed in the slide one of the key words was awareness. So my question, I guess, is because I think it's such a viable project. Are we looking to target multiple audiences within the community for this? And I mean, going down to like, junior high and high school students, because I think it's a message that appeals to everybody. So I just want to get it out there. I think it's a broad project. And I just want to make sure we don't miss any audiences when we build a message going forward. Um, can I just respond to that quickly? Because I, I also totally agree with that. Um, and I think it's something um, you know that, that Rachel has, has talked about, um, which is that the way that um, kind of thinking of that that pot of money um, that Rachel talked about for public art that there would be a certain percentage um, used for you know potentially like um, maybe a, a larger name artist but I think just as you suggested Michael that that other pots of money the way that gets divided up could help it direct in exactly the way that you're saying that there could be student projects around this that, that could build awareness. And, and I think we're, we're equally excited about those kinds of projects. Yeah. Um, and then Ruth. And, I, and I'm also just aware that I know we're almost probably over our time. And I, I had one more slide with another set of questions, but I, if we have time to look at that. So, and then Ruth had a, a, quest, a question. I actually comment. just wanted to check and see how we were doing for time as the <laughs> chair, I wanted to ask Rachel how you felt we were doing for time here. I think this is a really important conversation. And so if, you know, I, I would say, you know, take as much, I mean, to a, to a degree, take as much time as we need right now. If we have more questions, um, then okay, well, that's great. I'm super glad to have you. And while I um, am here, I just wanted to um, just acknowledge, I know somebody said John Alexander is on the call with us. And for those of you who don't know, John is the director or manager of the wastewater treatment plant. And we just like threw him on the spot and brought him into the call. So thank you. <laughs> and also um, we have a couple of other members of our sustainability staff who are watching. So I'm getting messages from them. And one is from Carrie Lux, who's our sustainability manager. 
And she just wanted me to point out to you all that there's also a good, excellent, a good information resource on the city's website under, it's called City Utility 101 that defines three water types, potable water, wastewater, and stormwater. So that's just as an FYI, defining those buckets that our water falls into. So thanks, Carrie. And I see John's hand is up. <laughs> yeah, I just I just wanted to add a couple things under the, the previous slide um, about the fundamental issues that we're kind of experiencing right now is especially related to drought. Um, because Davis is extremely good at um, conserving water, it has increased the concentration of pollutants in our water, which basically has reduced the capacity of the plant um, from 6 million gallons a day of average dry weather flow down to about 4.8. Um, so the, uh, drought is a huge um, issue for, for us with that. Um, and Davis is extremely well, at, or do, does extremely well at uh, conserving water. Um, and then um, just looking at the slide one more time. Uh, you know, I think the awareness, I think one of the things is, is that we're definitely, this city is definitely moving towards recycled water. I mean, we, we produce recycled water right now that only goes to the Willow Slough bypass and the, um, the wetlands. We keep the wetlands wet with our water, but we're, we're looking to try and cross the Willow Slough bypass with a pipe and to get it down to Howard Ranch and to eventually get it into town in the next 20 years. Uh, it's gonna be a lot of money to get that out over there. But we have a recycled water program that we're kind of trying to implement. And some of the water is currently, once our recycled water pump station is built, we'll be going over the landfill for them to use for uh, irrigation, for agriculture and for the new compost facility that's going in. Uh, it's called Napa Recycle. And so they, so there's some exciting things going on since, uh, since the last time we got on one of these meetings, uh, which was back in, I think, 2020 or something. Yeah. October, 2019. Or 2019. <laughs> yeah. So it's been a while. Um, but yeah, I, I'm excited to, to get this moving forward. Uh, I saw a, a lot of great ideas from the, from the class that, to, that put forth those those small presentations and projects it was really interesting. So that's just kind of what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's great to hear those updates from you, John. And I did have one question. Uh, so you're talking about the Davis wetlands. Is that the Vic Fazio preserve there? Is that something different? No, that's different. Um, the, the, the wetlands were actually constructed, I can't remember what year it was, maybe 97. Anyway, it was, it was constructed by the, uh, by the Army Corps of Engineers, um, and we actually used it as part of our treatment in the winter. Um, over our overland flow treatment process would not um, be able to meet effluent limits during the winter when it was raining. So it would go out to the wetlands for additional settling. And then once we, once our new upgrade came in um, and we were completed with the upgrade facility, um, we didn't need that anymore, but it, what a great asset that we have, you know? So, so we actually use that water to um, just to keep it wet, the wetlands wet and keep the habitat uh, there. So, but it's the, it's the Davis wetlands basically. Um, so I'm going to just move to my last slide just because I, I know we're over time at this point, but I wanted to just highlight these few questions. And if folks want to comment right now, they could, or if they wanted to, um, you know, send Rachel an email that, that you could share with us. Um, you know, I, I think really our, our big question to all of you um, is a, around what um, the, the last one, which would, what would make a kind of successful use of this public art um, funding and how do you see this really being a kind of successful project um, and obviously we need to consider you know some this engagement is happening during a pandemic so um, how do we do kind of engagement in a safe way but but I think really most importantly that last question like are there certain visions that folks have um, that, that see this as a kind of successful project that if anyone either wants to share that now um, or, um, you know, email and, and share it with us later. And I see Carol has a comment. Just really quickly, um, 
John brought up a, a point, in, uh, a port, uh, important point, and that is uh, the the water goes into the wetlands, and and the wetlands support the wildlife, right? It supports all the migrating bird, uh, waterfowl. There are all sorts of you know things like crayfish and little um, baby salmon and all that in, in the wetlands, both uh, the, the Yolo bypass and also uh, near the wastewater treatment plant. So it's not just people that benefit from wastewater, it's, it's also the environment and, and the, the, the critters that live in, in these wetlands, right? And so I think that they have to be part of the conversation too. I, and they I can't would, speak for themselves is the problem. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. I think that's, that's great. I would encourage everybody um, that, that we, we've updated our website pretty well uh, on the city of Davis wastewater uh, section of the website. So you guys could really uh, gain some knowledge by just clicking on some of the information that, that we've put up there. I've just completed a video uh, that, that will be up pretty soon, as soon as the media company gives me the final version, which really is a overview of the wetlands and the, uh, and the wastewater plant in depth. So it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's an informational video that, that you guys would be able to see. So that, that might help you determine uh, some, some direction that you might want to go towards. That's great. Thank you, John. I see Melissa has a comment. Yes, good evening, everyone. My apologies for um, running late from work here, but um, I'm glad to be here just jumping into this conversation. And my, my only thoughts is um, if I wonder if there's a possibility to acknowledge that the, the waterways exist on a land, a land that has a history, an indigenous history, uh, but one wind tune history. And so I recognize that here we are in this time in history living, but there, there is a history of how this land was. And we have Kat Anderson, like right here, you know, at UC Davis that has really done an excellent job to tell us through her research, Tending the Wild, of what the waterways, what the land was like here. And so, um, you know, we're just doing our best to raise awareness of what's happening now. Uh, but I wonder if there's a way of uh, sort of just acknowledging um, past and present. That's really great. Thank you yeah. so much, Melissa. Thank you. I just picked up that book. It's part of my summer reading. So I'm so excited. Yeah, so I'm, we're on board with that, absolutely. I think Carol. Uh, I, just in response to that, I'm an art docent at the Crocker Art Museum and also at the Minetti Shrem here in mm -hmm. Davis, both. And we do acknowledgements of the Putwin uh, tribe and the, the land that the museum is on um, before we do our tours. And so, you know, maybe something I, you know, at least that at the very minimal, I think would be appropriate. Yeah, well, I, we always say that, you know, as we strive to um, communicate community stewardship towards sustainability, um, you know, there's thousands of years of precedent of indigenous sustainable land and water management by indigenous communities. So I think it, it makes a lot of sense to sort of preface any kind of conversation about water management um, in this landscape for that very reason. And I saw Rachel had her hand up. I, <laughs> I put it up briefly and then put it back down. Um, no, I just, I wanted to thank Melissa for bringing that, that issue up. And I just wanted to let you know that, you know, part of this conversation is for us to look at holistically kind of what are all of the different facets that tie into this. And that is, absolutely one of them. Um, and it's a really wonderful opportunity, both for us as we bring this story and this project to the community to acknowledge that, but also then hopefully 
as something that artists can respond to and use as a part of storytelling, you know, as the art that gener is generated out of this project, something that is living and that is, um, you know, becomes a part of our community that will help carry that history forward. Um, so so thanks. just um, maybe one last question that I, I would like to leave with folks. And again, if they want to maybe, um, you know, email Rachel that she could forward to us, um, uh, really thinking about like, who should we be meeting with? You know, who are the communities? Um, you know, we had a great list that we had kind of worked, um, you know, with, with John um, in that meeting in, in 2019, but, but now people are meeting in different ways. What are the, you know, uh, so many meetings are happening on Zoom. So who should we meet with? Um, and, and really, I, that maybe that's something that, that folks can just help us with. Um, so that we can really get the message out there um, and, and make this, um, you know, kind of get people's voices to help make this a, a, a participatory uh, event. So, and I think Melissa had another comment. Well, my comment was actually related to, to what you were saying. I was just going to say that um, I wanted us to be aware that uh, Yosho Dihi Wintu Nation just just recently hired a curriculum uh, writer, and so um, there's a way in which, um, yeah, County Office of Ed and that curriculum writer are partnering up to just create um, educational awareness for our like, Yolo County schools. So that curriculum writer, maybe let's invite him. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. And I think Yvonne and Rachel. Yeah. yeah. I, I was just thinking now, can, can you hear me? Oh. Um, about um, speaking to community groups. Um, I'm in the noon rotary and there are two other Rotary clubs in Davis. And we have speakers like you would be to inform us of different things that are happening in the community. And so that would be a wonderful way to spread the, the word. Um, Rotary, Kiwanis, um, whatever other civic um, volunteer organizations like us. Oh. Thank you, Ivan. Yeah. Well, we have a way, um, Rachel, just um, will you help coordinate us following up with folks? Yeah, yeah. I was just going to offer, um, just because I think we should wrap up now, that um, I will coordinate with Brett and Claire and kind of send out a little follow up, like almost like a survey, just to solicit some more feedback so you can give it some more thought and, um, and then we can kind of put all that information together. And, and like I said, this is a kind of a starting conversation. Like we will have other opportunities to continue to come back to this throughout this process. Many of them, <laughs> so fear not. Thank you so much everyone for the feedback. It's super, super appreciated. Yeah, thanks so thanks for... much. We're really Thank excited. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that presentation. And you are welcome to stay and watch the rest of our very exciting commission meeting, or you are welcome to go pour yourself a beverage of choice and have a lovely dinner as you like. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, that was great. Thank you. To them. Thanks, Rachel, for arranging that. And thank you to everybody. Are we moving on to our next item, grant program update? Yes. Yes, yes. I am just pulling up a document to share with you all. If you please give me one minute. Great. So, um, I'm going to share my screen. Oh, so it looks like somebody else is still sharing. Jesse, do you have a way to, or maybe I can just. 
Um, it's possible you there. just hit the button the split second that I was <laughs> letting you. That's okay. I think it's on now. Does yep. everybody see that? Now. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So um, just, I'm going to kind of go through some highlights in our, this is in our staff update. So hopefully people had a chance to read this. I know I kind of inundated you with a lot of information. So thank you. Um, we, our staff um, applied for, so this is Joseph Fletcher, who's our theater manager, applied for this grant called the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant. And we were um, really grateful that we received a, close to $60,000 and then actually an extension of that. So close to $90,000 now. Um, and that is going to the Vets Theater that will compensate us. It's relief funding from the Small Business Association and it helps to, um, you know, to fill in for the fact that we were closed and did not generate any revenue last year. And that money is gonna go into our equipment replacement fund and hopefully be used to do some upgrades um, of some of our technical equipment that really is in big need of upgrades. So that's really exciting. Um, I just finished applying for a grant through the National Endowment for the Arts, which is also um, American Rescue Plan funds, um, which you might hear referred to as ARP funds or ARPA funds. Um, I applied and don't know if we are competitive in this or not. We have not found out yet, but um, I applied for a $100,000 grant. And if we receive this, the money would be used directly to reaward back out into our arts community just to help um, compensate our local artists and arts organizations for operating costs. Uh, there is a real pretty dire situation right now with some of our local organizations just really not having enough money to be viably operable right now. And so, um, so we're, we're hoping we get that and, um, and that that can, you know, help go back into the community. So um, the, the next item in here um, is, is more about this American Rescue Plan funds. And there's some background on this. And I just wanted, sorry, I'm flipping back and forth in my screen here. If just a show of hands of folks on the call here, how many people are familiar with the ARP funding or the American Rescue Program funding? If you could just put your hand up and hold it up for a second just so I can see. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so what is happening right now is the federal government granted a large sum of money, um, which you can see in this, a quite large sum of money, $1.9 trillion as an economic stimulus package. And that money then is trickling down and going to states, going to counties, going to cities, um, and then being administered through various agencies with the federal government as well. So like the grant that I applied for through the NEA was part of that American Rescue Plan funding. So there, um, we have been sharing out through the um, arts social media, both the city's arts so social media and the Arts Alliance social media information on various efforts for community members to plug into um, ways to, to share communications with both our county leadership and our city leadership. Um, the county process in deciding how those funds will be allocated is happening kind of now. Um, they had a big workshop last week and then they actually are having another meeting tomorrow. So there it has been a lot of um, activity through various members of leadership of Arts Alliance Davis communicating with them um, about just advocating to please support, you know, funding going into the arts community. And um, right now we have a subcommittee of our own city council. Um, it's Lucas Frerichs and Will Arnold. They are the subcommittee that's going to be leading the effort to figure out how to allocate our city funds. Um, and that will be coming up. So there is going to be a some kind of one or several community workshops. And I will absolutely let you know when that happens and encourage everybody to participate in those. Um, and those will be an opportunity for community input around how the city decides to spend those funds. So um, I spoke briefly with our one of our city managers today and we think the next few weeks um, that there should be more information about that um, those opportunities for input. And when that happens, um, you know, there will be more direct outreach to the different various commissions in the city to provide official commission input around this process, but also as individuals, you're obviously welcome to participate in that. Um, apologies, I don't know why all these S's are here after meetings. <laughs> 
many, many meetings, so many meetings. Um, so are there any questions about, about the American Recovery or Rescue Program? Yes. Um, rescue plan, sorry, I have to click back and forth to see. So um, you cannot see who, oh, Melissa. Yes, hi, Rachel. Um, hi. I, I thought that these, that there had been discussions and decision made about which uh, projects were gonna be supported. I remember two in particular that were highlighted. Um, so I'm wondering, is this like additional funding that will be coming to the city specifically and not like through the county or, so or like are through you, the county to the city? So there's two separate um, amounts. So um, let's scroll back up here. So the, the county is receiving $42.8 million dollars and the city is receiving $19.7 million. So those are separate processes. Obviously there's bound to be overlap because you know these places are, we're geographically overlapping and our services are overlapping and I don't exactly know how that's going to work. Um, I imagine there is an effort to coordinate those as much as possible so that there's not redundancy and that we are you know, best spreading those, those resources out. Um, I think what you're talking about was on the county workshop last week. They did have, there were two specific things that were called out um, and then a number of other priorities that were established that, um, that they were going to then finalize how decisions were going to be made to divvy that money up. Is that, is that what you're asking about? Yeah, that's good clarification for me. Thank you. Okay. Rachel. Okay. No worries. Thank you. I saw somebody else's hand up. Uh, Ruth. Yes, I just I wanted to just make sure that we talked a little bit and I wanted to see what the new commissioners thought and get some input on how we can be involved in making sure that we bring it in front of. Oops, you just cut out. Um, will you repeat that again, Ruth? Ruth, your sound, your audio, your audio is not coming through. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can now. Okay. I, I guess I, I would like to get some comment if we have a minute from the other new, new commissioners and our old commissioners about how we can get involved in making sure this money can also be shared out with the arts and therefore flow out to the community and maintain our arts community so it doesn't get lost in this crisis. So I, I guess I'm interested to hear what other people have to say and how they'd like to be involved in making sure this happens. Thanks. Do you want me to address that? Sure, um, if you could, have... I would. Yeah, I would so like it. so it, I have to be very honest, it's a little bit of a, um, of a confusing situation. So as a city staff person, um, we are not allowed to be direct um, we can't lead an advocacy effort. So what we are doing our best to do is inform um, members of the Arts Commission as well as members of the arts community or general public. Um, we have several tools that we're doing that with. One, the main one is through our social media. So um, if you have not already followed the arts social media on Facebook or Instagram, that's a really important place to be looking for that information. I am definitely sending out to you because I know there's a lot in there and it's easy to get lost. But when there are specific actions, I am definitely emailing them to you directly. So the county had a call out um, requesting, you know, solicitations for input. The city will do that as well. And I will be sure to send those all to you very directly and explicitly. So it's really um, I cannot communicate strongly enough that the next month or so is going to be a really, really important time to really pay attention to that information as well as you can follow city council actions during that time. Um, I, my understanding is that the city council will come to us and ask us for specific feedback as a commission, but you are all also um, welcome to make public comments or provide communications directly with city council as an individual in the community on, on your own personal behalf. Um, so does that clarify? 
and it's uh, honestly, we're learning this process as we go because it's kind of unusual. Um, but I will do my very best to inform you all of when there are opportunities and, you know, just it's, it's a time to take extra steps and to kind of, um, to, to show up, even if you're tired, write a letter, make a public comment. It's really important for, for city leadership and county leadership to hear from people right now. Um, so they, you know, so they're aware of what's happening. There are a lot of needs in the community right now. And a lot of people asking for things and, um, you know, and everybody's doing their best to try to accommodate that. But I think like the county workshop said that they had, um, you know, I think that they, they have 42.8 million and I think they got something like $350 million worth of asks. So, I mean, there's a lot that is being asked that it's not gonna be able to be um, supported. So it is an important time to be, pay attention and be vocal when you have the opportunity to. And there, and I think that at our next meeting, we probably will have a more official agenda item on this to, to come up with either a statement or a specific communication surrounding this. Thanks. Does that any, do you have an additional question that I can answer about that or did that help? That, that was helpful. I, I really wanted to know how we as a commission can forward the agenda of the arts because yeah. I know that there's a there's a lot of demands on this money and we'd like to make sure that we're heard and yeah yeah the best thing you can do is um I will keep sending out information and resources and just try to keep abreast of them and then just try to participate when there are opportunities to participate okay thank you thanks thank you for asking that very important question okay so um, community arts grants, this is just status quo from before. We still have had that portion of our budget reduced. So we are not um, going to be offering those this fall like we typically do. We um, have only received just several um, applications so far for funding through our arts and cultural affairs fund. Um, the International House Davis is a carryover from funding that we awarded last year, but this is the solidarity space public art process. And so we, that should be kind of rolling out in a, in a bigger way for people to participate in soon. Um, and then we funded, um, this is an additional fund just to help rent the theater space um, to the Bike City Theater Company and the Culture Co-op operated by Sandy Holman to produce a youth theater piece based on her children's book. Um, so we do have a, a decent amount of funding in that um, fund. So if you know other, th this is something you can as commissioners refer people to and let them know that this is a, this is a funding source if people need help right now. There's information about it on our website and you can always direct them um, straight to me if you like. Any questions about that? Great. Okay, so I am not going to read item by item through this. I think um, we'll be squaring our new Poet Laureate in in September. Uh, this is September, September 21st. I'm very excited about that. And she has lots of great ideas. So um, stay tuned for more on that once she is, once she is fully engaged and active. Um, the, the couple of important items that I wanted to highlight tonight are, um, these are two shots of a piece called Balance Beam by Cedric Wentworth. And this is actually a piece of art that we already own. We already have a place picked out for it. And it's just an update because I wasn't sure that the new commissioners were aware of this. So it's in storage right now. And this is going to be cited in front of the access to the theater, to the Vets Memorial Theater. Um, and we are in the process, hopefully, in the very near future of um, working with an engineer to de develop the um, installation requirements, both for this piece and also for the piece called Frog Totem, which I'm gonna share next. So um, that will be exciting and has been long in the works. And then um, it was really exciting because we have been working on acquiring this piece of art called Frog Totem for several years. It was totally stalled out during COVID and we just finally signed a contract, purchased the piece of artwork and got the artwork in Davis. 
And it was actually so much better and more exciting and more fabulous in person when it was delivered that it was really wonderful. Um, the here are some close ups of the of the piece. And um, I, I know I've already shared this with all of you. So this is just to give you a couple of extra um, extra shots I wanted to show you. I'm gonna pull up a, a quick folder for a minute. Um, I feel like I'm one of those people on the call line, like, please bear with me. I'm opening my computer and it's slow, but I really am. Um, even though I thought I had all of this stuff open, of course it is not open. Okay, anyway, I'm just gonna show you these two for now and tell you about the other pictures because they are not readily pulling up. But um, what is really wonderful about this piece is that uh, the way that it is, the way that it is installed, there's a triangular base and then there's kind of a cylinder that comes up and the pieces kind of fit in almost like a puzzle and almost like a, like beads that come down over this center piece. And so when we, when we purchased the piece, we only were able to look at pictures of it remotely. And what we couldn't see was the inside of the piece is actually the cylinder that says, um, save the frogs on one side and Salva las ranas, which means save the frogs in Spanish on the other side. And so it was like this totally delightful, like surprise, perfect for Davis treasure to have this thing uncovered and have that be in it. It made it just so much more um, kind of apropos for our community. So that was really wonderful. And, um, and right now the piece is in storage and at eight o'clock this evening, I will need to pop off of this meeting because I'm gonna be, um, proposing this to our Open Space and Habitat Commission for approval of a location um, in South Davis in the Woodbridge open space area, which is super exciting. So any questions about that? Excellent. Okay, moving on. Um, you will find in your packet a proposal from myself and from Joseph Fletcher, who is the theater manager um, for requesting or recommending to allocate funding to, um, I'm gonna actually scroll down to it and then scroll back up, to solicit, um, to allocate funding to put a mural into the vet center, the um, into the Veterans Memorial Theater lobby. Sorry, this is the pictures I was trying to find before. <laughs> so back to frog totem momentarily. So this is not a very good quality picture, but this is what the frog totem uh, looks like when it's installed. And this is all we could see of the picture actually, but then um, of that cylinder in the middle. But then when we received it, it actually has this wonderful kind of cartoony frog on it. And then on the other side of it is where it says, uh, save the frogs and Sava las ranas that you can see here. And here's some more photographs of it. Okay, now back to the theater. I'm sorry, there's not an easier way to switch back and forth through this. So, um, so again, so this is, everybody should have received this in the packet if you did not have time to review it at all. It is a proposal um, with background information to place a mural on this space. So when you enter the, um, the Vets Theater lobby, I'm gonna zoom in on this so you can see the whole thing. Um, more of the mystery S's here. I don't know why those all are there, but you get lots of S's. Um, when you enter the theater lobby at the Veterans Memorial Theater, you walk in and there is this large overhead red wall and um, our, our new theater manager, Joseph Fletcher, who's been there for a couple of years, is really interested in putting a mural up here and making it a really sort of um, aspirational piece for the city to really kind of rebrand the space, kind of redefine it, bring in somebody to do something wonderful, um, you know, as we are trying to kind of revitalize that theater space. So I am um, gonna Rachel? take a minute. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Carol has her hand raised. 
thank you for telling me because I could not see that. So um, oh. Carol, go ahead. Oh, thanks. I, I'm sorry, just a quick question based on the last um, issue about the frog totem. Um, is, is that suggested placement on the 12 mile loop, the bike loop? Um, I don't believe it is. It's a little on the outskirts of the bike loop. But is it reachable? By bike, very reachable by bike. By bike. As you're going around the loop, you could just go off. Very easily, that, yeah. Because I, I know I go right by the big butterfly one. Yeah. Uh, and that's really nice. I was just kind of hoping it would be something that people it's, could ride their bike by. It's it's right on the bike path. It's not on the actual 12 mile loop, but it's on the Greenbelt bike path in South Davis, um, super accessible. Okay, good. Sorry. No, that's okay. Sorry if I didn't clarify that. Melissa Moreno has her hand up too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Melissa? Uh, yeah. Um, do commissioners know, but, um, normally get notified when there's like a call for a muralist or an artist or, you know, anything like that or? Yeah, I mean, normally you are the ones who will be putting out those calls. <laughs> so you will know about them and hopefully help publicize them. And yeah, definitely. Um, did you, was, it, was that question in relation to anything in particular? No, just that in general. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah in general, and, and I'm sorry, because um, you missed, we did kind of a deep dive overview at the last meeting of all of the different kind of programs in process. So I can bring you up to speed on those, but um, you know, because some of the things you're coming in mainstream on that have been in the works for the past few years, but um, you know, new projects that we have coming on, like we, you all as a body will kind of decide what the emphasis is on and what the RFP or RFQ looks like when we put out a call for artists and then be involved in that selection process for sure. Um, so uh, go in, any other questions on that right now? Good. So going back to the Veterans Theater, um, are, are there right off the bat, um, so we wanted to introduce this this evening. If you have questions or would like more information, I can bring that back at a later date. If you um, want to make a motion on it, you can. I, I, will, um, I do wanna take a minute to pull up some additional images that I have for this um, because we put together some some images from other theaters just to give you an idea of what kind of the vision is. Ruth has her hand raised. Thank you, go ahead, Ruth. Oh, you're muted, Ruth. I think that you're about to answer the question I had, so I'm gonna wait till I hear what you say. Okay, <laughs> thanks. And I see Carol has her hand up as well. I was just, before we do any vote on this, I would like to discuss the, uh, the price range. Yeah. And, and so I'm, I'm interested in what other places have done for what, what price range is. Yeah. Good question, of course. So um, we have not done a ton of research on this. Jesse and I did a little bit of research to look at sort of estimates um, for murals. There is a, a huge range. Um, you know, depending on the space, the size, the notoriety of the artist, the available resources, um, and many factors. And so there is not a, a kind of square set, you know, like it's this much. So it, it's a little, I mean, and this is the case a lot of the time with when we do public art um, calls is there's not always like a really cut and dry amount. So we put in, um, in this proposal, I did put in a, um, an estimated amount that was a recommendation of between 10 and $15,000. And that is a starting point to consider. Um, you know, that will be up to you all to make a decision or to ask more questions and we can bring more information back or to do more research. So um, yeah, so, so Carol, was there a specific question about, about the amount? Or just that. Uh, just I think I think you covered the, you know, the parameters that you have all these things to, to consider. Yeah, I know that, 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 that 
the mural behind the Pence Gallery was, I think, 14,000. That was half of it. But that was huge. Yeah. That was like the whole wall of the building. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that one is substantially larger, probably like six times or something like that. But uh, was maybe not quite of, that big. And it was what, but, 10, 10 years ago, maybe now. Yeah, so it, this is a, um, you know, we're in a, a nice position where we have funding right now. So, um, you know, our goal is to, of course, be getting getting great artwork up and getting great artists paid. Um, but again, the ten to fifteen thousand was an estimate based on sort of what we think is the ballpark for that space and the setup there. Um, I see Chad has his hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, I think it's a great idea to to add some um, some art and give that place character. Like, I think it it suffers from being sort of like, I don't know, part of a very institutional feeling building with the vet center. So I think the, mm -hmm. you know, so I think the more that, you know, that the, the mural can, can give it its, its own identity and give it kind of a, I don't know, a, not, not like a safe, sterile <laughs> identity, right? Something that's going to, going to, going to be kind of push the envelope a little bit and, and kind of yeah. give it, give it that cool feel, I think would be, would go a long way. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Jesse looks very excited. <laughs> um, okay. I see Jill's hand is up and then Ruth. I was just curious where it, it talks about maybe the lower portion being a possibility and what that might do to the price. I'm just, I'm just thinking of this like very vibrant sort of living space and, you know, I'm not like an Instagram person, but just this idea that, you know, trying to get perspective of how, you know, photographs of, performing artists or people who are visiting there, how it can, it can kind of have an identity outside of those walls. You know what I mean? And so I don't, I can't tell from the perspective whether you can actually capture that mural within the space, if it's just on the top portion, like I can't tell how far back you are in that photo. And so that was yeah. just a thing I had about, you know, the value of kind of bringing it down and just kind of having yeah. that go, go outside the walls. That's, uh, that's a great, comment and something to think about. And so are you all look, is my, I can't tell exactly what's sharing on my screen, but are you all looking at the red wall again? Yeah, okay. So the, um, the piece that we were looking at initially was this top piece. Um, there is also this wall that comes down and there's this wall that comes over. And yeah, I don't, there's not enough here to see, but there also are you know, there's a large wall to the right and there's a large wall to the left and there is this wall and there is, um, this is actually a piece of public art, but it's that's a whole other question I think that is worth um, evaluating within the context of this conversation um, is there has been a lot of interest in relocating this piece that feels like it's just doesn't really feel quite in place entering the theater. And so, you know, part of that conversation could actually be looking at doing something that extends down to this space as well. So you really have almost like a more immersive experience coming in with, um, you know, with having like the drama of that whole entire wall. So that's a great thing to consider. Ruth. Oh, you're muted again. <laughs> I had to switch computers because mine was going out. So sorry about that. Uh, I wanted to know if had any direction had come from the Veterans Theater about the kind of style that they're thinking about, whether, you know, because you referenced the WPA here and, and kind of a social art or whether we're looking at more of an abstract art or are we looking for something that's very theatrical or was there any direction or is that just something we'll be thinking about later? No, I, um, I pulled up to share with you and I will do so now. So are you seeing a different picture now or are you still on the red wall? Red wall. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing that and I'm going to reshare with you. Yeah, so um, Joseph Fletcher picked out some examples of artwork and... Um, do you mean they picked out the artists already or just like no, samples? No, 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 no. He picked out some examples from other spaces to use as um, just as models. So are you seeing a picture now from another theater? No, we're, we're just seeing a menu. Oh, okay. Hold on. Oh, 
How about now? Yes. Sorry. Yes. If, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> sorry, I can't see anybody's faces. So you're all, I think, nodding. And I'm... Okay, so um, yeah, so just to, to respond to Melissa's question, um, no, we can't just select an artist. So where the process starts is just by having a conversation like what we're having now, looking at different examples, thinking about styles, thinking about how we would articulate, um, you know, what we would want in this. And, and then, you know, I would begin to draft, or if anybody's interested in working on that process, draft um, a request for proposals or request for qualifications and invite artists who are interested in to apply for this. And then, you know, it's a whole process then where we would have um, a subcommittee of the Arts Commission as well as stakeholders. Like in this particular case, we would probably have, um, well, we'd for sure have Joseph Fletcher as the manager there, um, probably potentially some other people who are involved with the use of the theater or the Vet Center in general, who would be part of that selection process. So um, I was just gonna share with you some examples of um, some things he pulled up. And this is certainly just like a quick, a quick overview. So did that just switch screens to a new picture? Yes. Yes. Great. Great. Okay. So, um, so, so what what his recommendation was was not to have something that sort of is like a historical overview, but something that is more aspirational, that more kind of is something that celebrates, um, you know, aspects of our community. Like this, obviously, is a historical picture that I'm showing, but I think just stylistically you know, looking at something that is similar to ours where it's like a frieze that runs above, um, you know, an entrance. Um, this is something I pulled out just as another style of mural, just to think about different, different thing, different styles that could go up there. Um, you know, these are, these are pieces he pulled up that are very much in line with sort of the style of the Works Progress Administration WPA projects. I think this is a mural in Philadelphia, I think. Um, but you know, there are, there are many different approaches to that space. And so the way that we would ideally, um, ideally select this is come up with the criteria for what we would like this space, what we would like the mural to do, like how it would impact that space and then have artists respond to that. And this is just actually something I just saw a couple of weeks ago in, um, down near Santa Barbara in the theater. You can see very similar to ours, the, um, the entrance to the theater is down here and this is on the wall as you come in up, up the top. So that's, that's just to give you kind of just a few ideas. I mean, there are clearly tons and tons of murals um, in indoor spaces. Like the wonderful thing about this opportunity is that typically we have to deal with so many, um, so many different variabilities when a mural's outside, the weather, the elements, the opportunity for people to vandalize it. Like this is a wonderful space because it's inside, it's protected, it's elevated. Um, so really we could put something there and have it be pretty protected and, and you know, last for a long time. So, um, Rachel, so there's, there's uh, yeah. Um, just a question, is it just that wall or could it go around the room? Yeah, yeah, it could go around the room if we wanted to. Just after looking at those examples, that was kind of cool. Yeah, I see Melissa's hand is up. Yeah, so quick question. Would the muralist, would we assume that the muralist would be doing like focus groups with community members or just stakeholders would provide input on a mural so, or just the one artist or is any of that? So it could go different ways. Um, so th the one option is that the, the selection committee you know, reviews artists, looks at their work and determines that they like the work of a particular person and method and they receive the commission. And it's just a straight, you know, here's what we want, here's the artist we select and they come in and implement that. Um, there is another approach that could involve community input and, um, and just uh, Joseph Fletcher, who is the theater manager there, his background is in civic practice. So um, he's very interested in, in using that approach, either to develop, you know, the criteria for the RFP or to work with the artists, but to really have that be something where there is um, some community input, not, not community implementing the mural, like doing the actual painting, but having community input and in formulating kind of what goes into the imagery there. So that's definitely something that we could ask for if we want that, if you want that as a 
as a part of it, we can put into the RFP um, or RFQ that, you know, either that there is a desire to work with an artist who who incorporates that into their practice or when we select an artist, you know, the group that's selecting the artist can, if that's the preference of the group, can select an artist who demonstrates that that's how their practice works. Um, does that make sense? Like, we're not going to decide yes, tonight. It does. Okay, Thank we're you. done. We're moving on. Like, there's obviously more conversation that we'll have and decide before we actually roll out the call for artists. But um, yeah, that's absolutely a way it can work. So, any more questions about that? Uh, Rachel, um, I have mm -hmm. to. I apologize. I have to, to leave and go to another Zoom meeting, <laughs> but I'm, I'm in full support of this. I think it's a great idea. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So, um, so at this point, a couple of options that you have. One is um, if there is additional information or questions people have, you can um, ask those and we can bring additional information back to the next meeting. Um, if you are in favor of this, you somebody is totally um, welcome to make a motion and move it forward at this point um, with, with or without additional details. I mean, it doesn't have to be moved forward in its exact case, but um, you, you could be moved forward in some capacity just to keep it going. So, um, whoops. So where, what is the interest of the commission? I would move to move the project forward to explore um, options and you know price ranges and kind of just kind of uh, keep it moving in the direction of happening. Okay, so for that, I did not articulate very well to you what I meant just now. For, right. So we don't actually make, need to make a motion for that. I mean, we can just go ahead and continue that. If there's additional information, um, if we can identify specifically so, so um, Price, so what did you just say? Prices and and yeah, and possible um, artists or part, possible looks. Okay, so we will do um, we will do some additional research on this and try to come back to a future meeting with um, some some additional examples. Um, the the pricing. I mean, I think our pricing is in the pretty ballpark for that for the wall for right now, if we want to explore doing more wall, I think we would want to explore just adding more to the price. Um, and I will need to go back and talk to Joseph and, and maybe bring him to a future meeting to talk about it. Cause I think he can also articulate the vision he has of really what that does to change the space. Um, but, but generally, um, you know, that's good. I see Melissa has her hand up. So Melissa. Yeah, Rachel, I was wondering, will you be uh, drafting the call for the muralist and then we give the input or how does that work? So typically, um, yeah, I would draft something and then I would bring it to all of you for feedback, um, for additions, for specific language, and, and then you would all provide input then and I would then finalize it. Ruth? I was wondering if we could just uh, in general invite all the commissioners who might have mural ideas or muralists that they're aware of, bring those examples to us so we can see the broadest possible range of styles. That would be wonderful. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly the support of the commission in doing work outside of this meeting is really welcome. We have super limited bandwidth. So if anybody wants to spend some time looking at either um, other muralists, and again, we have, so we have to send out an open call to anybody who can apply, but if there are specific artists that we're interested in working with, we can, you know, reach out to them and invite them to make sure that they are on our mailing list. So, um, so that's definitely something that you all are, are very welcome to do is, um, is find any examples that you'd like and share them with me or Jesse. Do the, mural, do the muralists have be from Yolo County or the city of Davis? That is for us to determine. So um, 
each time that we put out a call for artists, we determine if we want the call to be local, to be Davis, to be regional. Um, you know, there are definitely times when going outside of that is, is a great opportunity. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of really wonderful muralists in this region. You know, if you draw a region around the Bay Area and Sacramento and us, um, you know, there are lots and lots of artists to choose from in that area. So I think personally, I would recommend that to you just to, to give ourselves more options in this space. But, um, you know, ultimately, that's a decision that the Arts Commission can make, and I can help you kind of track through that. I mean, there are certain times when it really makes sense to be very local. And, um, you know, I think the emphasis would always be on finding somebody who's close, but definitely you're not locked into that. Ruth. Just on an individual note, I was curious to know if you could in some way connect us to the names of the artists that you did show us so that we could think about that, like that Philadelphia artist. I wanted to know who that was. Oh, you know what? I'm not, I can look, but I'm honestly not even sure that I know who those artists are. Um, oh, okay. Joseph, Joseph provided those um, and I, I, I'll, I'll find out, but I think some of them just are more probably associated with a theater or something. I, and I can send them to you and we can see some of them. We can probably figure out who they are. I mean, there's two that were Diego Rivera. So he's not. Yeah, a I mean, there were definitely some in there that were his or, um, or, you know, people who are working with him. You mean we can't get him? <laughs> I know. <laughs> and one of them was Shepard Ferry and we probably can't get him. But. No, I don't think so. <laughs> but that Philadelphia artist was not Diego Rivera or Shepard Ferry. No, no, no. <laughs> No. And, um, and one thing I would recommend there's, um, I don't know if you're familiar, but Sacramento has had for the last probably four or five years, um, something called wide open walls, um, which is a mural festival that they have during the summer. And that's a great site to go on and look through the artists they've worked with over the past few years. Um, and also, you know, looking at Bay area artists, there are an abundant number of muralists in East Bay and San Francisco. Um, you know, and then we have some great muralists here in town as well. So there are lots of lots of options. Jesse, I just wanted to say that wide open walls is happening right now, and so um, there are a lot of cool processes you can actually watch in person in Sacramento right now. Um, and if you go on the website, you can see all. I, I actually haven't checked for this year, but um, so I don't know if it's updated. It probably is, um, but they have profiles of all the muralists. Um, yeah. The details and links to their websites and all that. So that's really yeah. interesting to look into. Yeah, it is. And um, thanks for that. And we have, and actually Greg Schilling, who's a local Davis muralist is one of the muralists this year. So that's exciting because we're getting our, we're getting our people out into other communities. So yay, go Davis. Um, cool. So, um, so is that, so for this point, I, I would say everybody go and do some research if you're motivated to. I will touch base with Joseph and come back to you with more information um, and an opportunity to talk about making a formal motion um, so that we can kind of move it forward officially. Does that sound good? Excellent. Okay, so I am gonna need to get off in a few minutes. So a couple things I wanted to do really quickly um, so Melissa, not to put you on the spot, but I need to do this because you weren't here at the beginning and I need to have you recite the oath. <laughs> so even though it's like in the middle of the meeting, um, I'm going to put it up and all you need to do is keep yourself muted and just say it on mute. Um, which is what everybody else did at the beginning of the meeting. And sorry to put you on the spot here, but if you could do that really quickly so we can swear you in, then we will have everybody swear it in, it's sworn in. Can you see that? All right, so take a moment, make the oath to yourself. and then just let us know when you are done. Excellent, thank you. All right, yay, everybody's official in our highly official process. Um, 
And I think I've received three of your four signed oaths. So um, somebody still owes me an oath, signed oath. And so if you have not sent it to me, I will be coming after you tomorrow. So send it to me, please. Um, okay. So the other thing that we have forgotten to do the last couple of meetings is we have been invited to um, select a representative to serve as part of the climate action. I'm gonna zoom us back up here. Um, of the climate action and adaptation plan. So there's a process that has been going on for a number of months that has to do with um, through our sustainability program. And before our new members came on, we had the opportunity to select a new member and we decided uh, to select a representative to this process. And we decided to hold off until we had new members. Um, so the process actually is quite in progress already. Um, I think there was some interest maybe on the, from Carol, and I don't know if there was interest in another person joining her, um, or even if she is still interested or not. But if we want to, we can select one um, person to be the official liaison from the Arts Commission to this process. It is, um, you know, it is more specifically relevant to um, some of our other commissions whose focus is more directly on natural resources and things like that. But there is definitely a nexus with the arts in, um, you know, the way in, in sort of how our community approaches environmental sustainability and environmental stewardship. So is there any interest from anyone on participating in that process, which would basically involve um, just paying a little more attention to it. And if you're available, attending their meetings or workshops and then reporting back to this group. And actually Carol's left already, I realized. So I think she was interested. So if nobody else is interested, we can select her in her absence since she had already expressed that. <laughs> Shall we do that? Yes. That's what you get yes. for leaving early. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, I, I will, since, since she very directly like volunteered to do that earlier, I think that's fine. We can select her and I will, um, and I will let her know that she has been appointed. She's in that capacity. Fabulous, done and done. Okay, um, let's take us back to our document and see what else we are missing on here. Great, okay. So I shared in this document, same upcoming RFPs that we've had for a long time. If any of you have had an opportunity to see the pole pol line olive overcrossing, um, you will know that that is getting closer to um, to reality. So we are we are in a position now where we can pretty quickly roll out the um, the call for artists for that. And what I'd like to do, we have a few different calls that we have the opportunity to put out, and I'd like to kind of try to put them out simultaneously. So both the pull line all of Uber Crossing one and the one that's for the corner of F and Covell Street that wraps around where the Little League field is. And um, and so that'll, so that should be coming soon. So I will hopefully at the next meeting be bringing back to you a draft of both of those. Fingers crossed that nothing else happens between now and then, but that should be coming soon. Um, okay. And the last item on here, oh, um, just to let you know that we did receive full funding for the um, celebration bench for Bob Bowen. That is all community donated. And we are um, have contracted now with artist Wes Horn, who's a local mosaic artist, to complete that piece. So he's working on that. And that's gonna be installed in G Street Plaza. And um, the last item on here that we've probably don't have totally have time to address, but um, there is, so this is a photograph of something called the Trefini Fountain, which is located within the senior center. It is a, um, it's a mosaic fountain that was created back in the eighties, I believe. And um, yeah, it is, anyway, can everybody see this photograph? Okay. Pretty well. So yeah. it it is it's multiple layers. It's a little difficult to see in this picture, but um, this is the bottom kind of height. There's like a larger basin, and then there's the a couple of taller 
sort of pillars. And it used to be that water kind of ran through those and came out over the top. It is pretty damaged, water damaged, and they're starting to lose tiles, as you can see here. And then there's sort of like a, like a split down these seams in a couple of places where the whole side is kind of not attached anymore. It's just sort of being held up by a little bit of grout. So, um, so we were contacted by the senior center to come look at it and figure out what to do with it. And there, it definitely needs to be repaired. So um, the first step that I would recommend is going to the artist who's Donna Billick and just letting her know that it's damaged and giving her the opportunity if she's interested in fixing it to repair it. It's at this point, it's sort of outdated for the space. And I think there's a lot of interest from the senior center in kind of reimagining either the piece or something else there and decommissioning it. So, um, so I am um, requesting feedback from you, from the arts commissioners about this. This does not have to happen tonight, but I guess what I would recommend is, um, is if between now and the next meeting, if any of you have time to go over to the senior center, pop your head in and take a look at it and just sort of um, get an idea for what the space looks like and see if you have any ideas. I think, I'm sorry I didn't include like a sort of bigger picture photograph here for context, but it's sort of in this little alcove that has seating. And I think the staff there are interested in kind of maybe thinking about removing the damaged portion of it, which is the taller portion and just leaving the bottom basin, which is pretty intact and either turning it into a planter um, or, or, you know, or thinking about doing something else in that space. Although it would be pretty destructive at this point to the space to remove it because kind of the flooring in that space now is tiled around this piece. Um, so I am bringing it to you for input ideas. And I am, unfortunately, I am gonna need to pop off of this meeting now because I'm gonna go make our big pitch for Frog Totem. Um, I wanted to just see what Ruth has to say, but then I'm actually gonna pop off. And then Ruth, if you all want to talk about it more um, and somebody can give me notes on it, that would be great. And then Ruth can wrap up the meeting when, um, whenever you're ready to wrap it up. Okay, hey, I, I just wanted to ask if there's a budget for this before we have a discussion. Um, there is not a budget. I mean, we, we have the municipal arts fund and that's part of what that money is for. Um, you know, I think we would come up with a decision like if, if we were to get a quote that says it's this much to repair it, that then we would have to make a decision and say, well, is it worth spending this much to repair it for what it is? Is it still relevant? Is it still serving its original function? Is it time to commission something else or reimagine this piece with the original artist? Um, so there's just some different options that we could look at. Okay. All right. Great. So um, I am going to say good night and thank you very much to everybody. You guys are welcome to just wrap the meeting up after if you want or continue to talk about this or other things more. If I could ask somebody to take any notes on anything that happens from now until the end, including what time we adjourn, um, that would be great and just pass them along to me tomorrow. Okay. Thank Hi, you. Rachel. Thank you. Good night. Good night. So uh, I think that it's getting kind of late and I'd like to know if anybody is absolutely committed to further discussing this or if we could table it to the next time, which would be my preference. What do people think? Table. <laughs> table? Okay. So uh, is that a consensus? Can everyone just say out loud, I, if you agree to table it? I. 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 Okay. I think we're going to go with a consensus on that. We will table it. I'll just tell Rachel that because I think it merits a longer discussion and probably would be helpful if we went and looked at it before we talk about it because I don't know yeah. what it looks like. So I, agree. I think we can go with that. So is there a motion to adjourn here? Oh, I'm, uh, I make a motion to adjourn. Okay. Can someone second that, please? <laughs> Oh, looks like we adjourned. <laughs> I guess that's it. I guess I have the, I have uh, Michael adjourns and I guess I have the authority to say good night. Great to work with all of you. I thought that was really productive and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.
Thank you, Jesse.